Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, just a couple of verses I want to read here. We have the story here of given of how the man who was possessed with demons was uh, how that he met the Lord and the Lord cast the demons out. And just as that story comes to a close, the man wanted to go with the Lord. In verse 19 we read, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. That's all that we'll read. I trust that God will bless the reading of his precious word with other scriptures that we'll quote. It's my desire tonight, my exercise, to tell you of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me, how I was reached and saved. I'm not here tonight to speak about what I have done. I think the hymn that we sang tonight would make that clear. Not have I gotten but what I received. Grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded. Pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. I can look back over my life and I give God thanks for great privileges that I enjoyed. I was born into a home where both my parents were saved before I was born. And I was brought up here in the gospel right from I was very young it was the desire of my parents that we the three of us would be reached and saved while we were young not only that but that we would go on and live our lives for the glory of God you know that was a big ambition for their family you know they wanted us to do well at school they wanted us to do well in our career as parents naturally would do but we knew that far above these things, they desired the spiritual blessing of their family. They desired our salvation. We were sent along to Sunday school from when we were young. And there, the word of God was poured into our hearts. We were taught the scriptures from early days. And on Sunday nights, we would have been found there in Bukna, in the gospel meeting, just like this one. And then there would have been series of meetings throughout the country, and we would have been taken along. And tonight as I'm here in Ballyclare, I look back over many years. Many series I attended here in this hall, right in those very seats. And up in the old hall, come past it there this evening. And I look back over many years. Times when we attended, I'm thankful for the exercise of the assembly here. Conscious too that the believers here in Ballyclare had a burden for me. And I know that I was prayed for by many of the saints here. And I would publicly like to thank you for that. And we give God thanks that, as we were reminded in the prayer meeting, he's a God who hears and a God who answers prayer. <clears throat> I have to look over those days of childhood with a measure of regret. Because in spite of the great privilege I had, you know, I was a careless boy. And I had little serious thought about my soul coming and going to gospel meetings hearing the gospel preached faithfully and of course there were times when I heard the voice of God and of course there were times when I would have longed to have been saved and yet I was just prepared to let other things stand in the way just I'll come for sake of time to <clears throat> when I was 17 and a series of gospel meetings commenced in Ballyvaddy. And I was there that Monday night. As far as I was concerned, it was just a normal gospel meeting. Maybe more taken up with who was there and all that. Didn't think too much about it. Tuesday morning, sitting at the table, just had finished my breakfast. Tell this for the sake of some of these young ones here who know who I'm talking about. My cousin Emma sent me a message. <clears throat> And then the message she said, just to let you know that I got saved in the meeting last night. And I remember she had typed, the judgment fell on Jesus' head. God's justice will demand no more. And those words, no more, she had typed in capital letters. You know what had happened? That Monday night, that first night of Monday night of the series of meetings, 
as the man was reading the hymn at the end of the meeting just before we stood to sing it, Emma drank in the truth that all was required to see if her soul was done when the Lord Jesus Christ died at Calvary. God's justice will demand no more. And she rested her soul there for eternity. That was a big voice to me. Emma's just a few months younger than I am. We grew up together. And I remember that Tuesday, I was at home that day, I think I was on study leave from, from, for exams, and sitting there with the books open, trying to study for my exams. And yet all I could think about was this, Emma's seal. And I, I just would have longed to know that I had that peace that no doubt Emma was enjoying. And there was more to come in those meetings because on the <clears throat> Monday night, I think it was the fifth week, came home from the meeting <clears throat> and went to bed. In a minute or two, I was over to sleep. And around about, I think it was 11 o'clock, my brother William came in and he woke me. He says, I have got saved. And that was a massive voice to me, my own brother. I was reached and saved. He was 20. I didn't know he had any thought about his soul. But as I was lying there in the bed, just falling to sleep, William was lying next to me. And in his mind, he was thinking about his soul and thinking of eternity and where he would be. And the thought came to his mind, if I don't get saved tonight, I'll be in hell. It came to him with such force. And he wondered what he should do. And one of the preachers, I think maybe that night in the meeting, had mentioned that scripture, that verse that says, search the scriptures. That came to his mind. He thought, I'll search the scriptures. He took his Bible from the bedside table. He went to the bathroom so that he could read it there without switching on the light in the bedroom. That would have uh, disturbed disturb, disturb me. And a short time later, sitting there, on the bathroom floor, his back against the radiator. Reading the words of John 5 and 24, William drank in the truth of it. He that heareth my word and believeth him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. You know, I remember the next morning coming down the stairs and I saw something that I wouldn't have seen, I don't think I ever would have saw it before. William <clears throat> wouldn't mind me saying he never was much of a reader. But that, on that Tuesday morning, I saw him there sitting in the armchair in the living room reading his Bible. And over the days it followed, and weeks and months and years, I watched on with interest to see the change in William. You know, God's salvation is a real thing. God's salvation makes a change in the life. And you know, I'm pleased to tell you that William was still reading his Bible, taking an interest in the things of God. You know, the, the reality to these things. There were others saved at that time as well. Neil was saved at only eight years of age. Others too, and it was a time of when God worked in a mighty way. But I didn't get saved at that time. Many a time I looked back and I wondered, why did I not get saved at those meetings? And yet, <clears throat> you know what's really, it's quite simple. The reason that William and Emma and Neil and others were saved at that time was because they set their heart on it. And they went in for salvation. And though I would have liked to have been saved, you know, I didn't set my heart on it. And I was willing just to let the school and the exams and all of those things take priority. And that time, that opportunity went by and I still was left in my sins. You know, <clears throat> as I grew older, at that time, as I say, I was 17. I went through <clears throat> my 20s into my 30s. Still not seeing. There were two times of the year that I really grew to dislike. 
One was my birthday, the other was the turn of the year. Because both occasions reminded me that I was another year older, still not seeing. And the passing of time was one thing that really spoke to me, just year after year. Realizing that that's just one more year of my life gone, one year nearer to to eternity. And though I tried to forget about it, I couldn't put it out of my mind, we're not here to stay. And as I got older, I become, became more conscious of this, that life was empty. And I was miserable. And how I would have longed to have been seen. You know, I remember a time when Stephen Gilfillan and David Strachan had the meetings here in 2018. God worked with me around that time. I can't go into that now. But the whole thing was just weighing in on me. You know, really I could say it was hard for me to cut against the pricks. And I remember at that time I was so miserable. I remember one night, <clears throat> just on this side, sitting about halfway down before the meeting started. I remember the Kennedys here, they came in, they sat down in the row in front of us. And I remember looking up and seeing Joshua there sitting in front of me, a young man. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it just be great if Joshua was to get saved in these meetings? Because I didn't want him to go on as I had done. And to reach the stage of life that I was now at, to have to experience that misery, and that pain that I was going through. And you know, I can't remember, was it that night or was it the next morning we heard the news Joshua could see it. And I lifted my heart to God and thanked him even though I wasn't saved at an interest in seeing others saved. But I must come to the time when I did get saved, 2020. You know, God was long-suffering. And a series of meetings commenced in Bukna, January that year. John Flack and Raymond Kirkpatrick were the speakers. People have asked me <coughs> since that, <coughs> when I heard of the meetings coming, did I make up my mind to go in for salvation? I have to be honest tonight and tell you, no, I didn't. When those meetings began, you know, I thought, well, I'll be there every night. That was my habit. And I thought those meetings will run their course probably six or eight weeks. And whenever they're finished, the Christians will be disappointed. My parents will be heartbroken and the preachers will be frustrated because that's just how it always seemed to be. And I was at those meetings every night. And those were good meetings. I remember nights when the hall was packed. You could have heard a pin drop. The presence of God was very real at that time. And I was there each night, as I say, And I knew the preaching was good. I knew the men were getting help. But I had no real thought about being saved. Came the Thursday night, the fifth week of those meetings. Came home from the meeting. I was up in my room and my father came up and he put his head around the bedroom door. He said, Raymond, I would like a word with you. He's on his way up from the hall. He'll be here any minute. Well, I didn't particularly want to talk to the preacher, to tell you the truth. But in the short time that I'd known him, I developed a respect for Raymond. And so I went down, <clears throat> and the two of us went into the sitting room there at home. I closed the door, and we had a good chat together. I remember Raymond asked me, <clears throat> he says, How are you finding the means? Well, I said, I'm there every night, as you know. I said, I'm sitting up and listening as best I can. But I'm afraid that's just about all I have to tell you. I said, nothing moves me. You men are preaching solemn things. So they were. 
No, they were knights whenever they preached on the Lord's return. How that at any moment the Lord would come to the air and snatch away those who are saved. And those who are not saved will be left behind for the judgment of God. And they preached about the great white throne and him that sat on it and whose face from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And how that those whose names are not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. And there it will be the lake of fire for all eternity. Solemn things indeed. And yet I said, nothing moves me. And Raymond, he asked me, he says, what are you expecting to happen? And I thought a moment and I said, well, maybe something would be spoken on that would stir me up. And I would go home from the meeting anxious to be saved. And then I'd get saved. That's how it always seemed to be when people told their testimonies. That's how it was for others. So I thought, just be careful, dear friend, you don't try to fit yourself into someone else's story. God deals with us all as individuals. And he put to me a question, he says, Philip, are you waiting on God to move? And I said, well, maybe, yes, maybe I am. He asked me a question. <clears throat> you might think it's strange, but I'll explain it. He says, Philip, do you remember the game of chess? And he was referring <clears throat> to a story, an illustration he'd given earlier in the meetings. A pilot, when they were younger, him and his brother Andrew would have played chess together. And maybe as it got late into the night, the two of them would have been sitting there across the chessboard. And they would have sat a while and nothing happened. And eventually one would have said to the other, It's your move. And I did remember the story. And Raymond, he said, Philip, <coughs> you're waiting on God to move. He says, God has already moved. He sent his son from heaven to die for you at Calvary to provide salvation for you that you might be saved. He says, God has already moved. Now it's your move. And I wondered, well, what do I do? How do I move? And he turned me to those verses in Isaiah 55. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Two things that God asked the sinner to do. is to seek him and to call upon him. How do you seek the Lord? Raymond told me that night. <clears throat> You'll find him in his precious word. Not just a casual glancing through the pages of the Bible. But he said, if you seek, he says, God will not withhold himself from you. Call ye upon him. How do you call upon God? In prayer. And he advised me that night, he says, you pray. And with an earnest heart, you call upon God. He will hear. And he will answer. We talked on <clears throat> for a wee while. I don't remember all that we discussed. But after a, a time, I remember <clears throat> Raymond, he leaned back in his chair. He says, Philip, do you know what I think you need? He says, I think you just need a real good dose of hope. He says, would you have lost hope? And that just summed me up, for I had lost hope. Oh, I was expecting that somebody would get saved in those meetings. But I never thought that that somebody could be me. And I would have been glad to have heard of somebody else getting saved. And yet, <clears throat> here I was, hardly believed it was possible that I could be saved after all this time coming and going to meetings. And as before we left that room that night, Raymond gave me just what I needed most, as he put it, a real good dose of hope. And those words were impressed upon me to the sinner who repents, returns to the Lord. It says, I will have mercy upon him. 
He will. God will have mercy upon him. He will abundantly pardon. Promise from God. And that night, <clears throat> before I turned out the light, I read, as Raymond had advised me to do, the first five chapters of Romans. And then I got down on my knees at the side of the bed. You know, I hadn't done too much praying before, but that night, quietly and simply and briefly, I prayed that God would enlighten my darkened mind and soften my hardened heart. In the days that followed, <clears throat> I was still was reading through John's Gospel. Any spare minute I could get there at work, I had the Bible onto my phone, and at work I would have been scrolling through reading, hardly knowing what I was looking for, but just knowing that if I was to seek, that I would find. And I began to realize that my heart was softening. And I began to know, I, I, I thought to myself, you know, I'm having an opportunity. God has said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. You know, there were times I wondered, have I had my last opportunity? And here was God calling me again. And I knew this, this time I have to go in for this. I can't let this pass, or this most likely is my last, my final opportunity to be saved. And it came to a Tuesday morning, and I decided I'm not going to work today. You know, in case anyone misunderstands me, Salvation is not a reward for giving up things. But I realized that day that this matter is too important to trifle with. I knew that if I went to work that day, very soon the phone would have been ringing. And there would have been plenty to have done, to have been doing to keep me busy. And I was afraid that these thoughts would leave me. Well, <clears throat> there were a couple of days and nights of struggling and trying and there's no profit in going into the detail of all of that. You know, we could just write over those days and nights just one word, unbelief. For I just was not prepared to believe God. And it came to <clears throat> the Thursday, the 20th of February, 2020. That morning, <clears throat> I spent the same way just reading over all those well-known gospel verses. John Flat came that afternoon to see me. And <clears throat> I remember he asked me, where was I struggling? You know, by this time, it was no secret that I wanted to be saved. You know, I didn't care who knew. And I remember saying to John, well, I was reading today in Isaiah 53 and 6. And my mind was focused mainly on that verse, even just the second part of that verse. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I said, how would I know that I was saved? And before John said anything else, he repeated the words of that verse back to me, I think, three times over. The Lord hath laid on him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. I said, Philip was there in the page of Scripture in black and white. And you can't deny it or dispute it. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. But all are not saved. <clears throat> That's just the point where I was struggling. All are not saved. He turned me to the New Testament. And there we read of who gets saved. John 3 and 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I remember <clears throat> he sat down, I think it was a track, we'll just use that hymn book. He says, there you are, as you are in your sins just now. And the wrath of God is abiding upon you. And it's only in the mercy of God that he has spared you until this moment. But he says, if the wrath of God falls, 
will fall on you. You're lost forever. But at Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ took your place. And the wrath of God fell on him, Calvary, in all its fury. And if you're sheltered there, the wrath of God cannot fall on you. I remember he told me the story. It was printed in a tract somewhere. How that in North America, sometimes there would be those fires that sweep across the prairies, burning everything in, its, in their path. <clears throat> the people would have heard of the danger, the fire coming. And they would have gone out and they would have burned, they set fire to a strip of ground. And that fire would have burned up a certain part and left a piece of blackened, charred earth behind. And the people would have gone there, sheltered there. The big fire, the prairie fire came, came to the place that was already burned. And it could come no further. It went out around and went on its way and the people were safe. I think the name of that tract is, is given, Stand Where the Fire Has Been. And just in the application of that, John told me how that the Lord Jesus Christ, he bore the wrath of God at Calvary. Provision was made just to stand where the fire has been, just to shelter there where the wrath of God has already fallen. And I would be saved. John put on his coat and went out into that winter's day. And I was left alone, thinking over these things in my own mind. You know, I should say that <clears throat> there were times in the past when I would have had a measure of interest in being saved. And my big problem was just this. I thought, you know, I'm not burdened enough about my sin. I'm not anxious enough. And that day as I pondered over these things, that thought came to my mind again. You know, I'm not anxious enough. I'm not burdened enough about my sin. And then I thought, well, what does the Word of God say? And I thought over verses that I had learned as a boy in Sunday school. I think I turned them up in the Bible that day. Romans 3 and 23, there it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Speaks there of every mouth stopped and all the world guilty before God. John 3 we read that he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3 and 36 I've already quoted. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth in him. And I thought well there I am, sinner in the sight of God. Condemned already, the wrath of God hanging over me, and I have no shelter. And I thought of Calvary. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I thought of that, well, that word all, you know, that's simple, isn't it? And so that takes me in. There's provision made for me that I might be saved. But that's not the moment when I get saved. Because I was faced with this, there's provision for me. But it's up to me as to what I do with it. And I thought of John 3 and 36. He that believeth on the Son. And the way it appealed to me was this. The wrath of God is upon me. It's about to fall and I have no shelter. There's nothing that I can do. My only hope is in Christ. And the way it came to me was just this. He that takes shelter under the sun hath everlasting life. And there in a moment, I was saved. You know, I could hardly believe it. Those people there in Luke's gospel, when they saw the risen Lord, they believed not with joy and wondered. How that after all those years I was reached and saved at last. And it was just simply by trusting, by resting upon the word of God. And it hasn't changed. 
And I throw out the lifeline to you, dear souls, tonight who are still in your sins. He or she that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Remember the second part of that verse. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Say more. I think I'd better give a brother Johnny the time. But I'm thankful for all that God has done for me. I'll give him all the glory as our prayer. You know, we had a good prayer meeting there tonight. One by one, the brethren prayed for the salvation of loved ones. Really, we could say tonight, oh, that my Savior were your Savior too. So I leave this with you. Trust it would be a help or an encouragement or a challenge to you. Trust that God will give help to our brother as he continues. <clears throat> It's a joy to be with you here in Ballyclare, and we again would reiterate the welcome. I'm glad to see each one that's come. We'll take a reading, please, from John chapter 3, John's Gospel chapter 3. Whilst you're turning to that, uh, just to be again express thanks to Philip for his coming uh, today and for his word of testimony. What an encouragement! Uh, to see God at work in a soul and bringing him to salvation. And it's possible even this evening, that's why we're here. And we desire and long that some sinner in this meeting might be saved. Maybe contrary to the most of you, I've, for the time I've known Philip, four or so years, uh, the majority of which he's been saved. But I tell you, when I first came to Bucknar at the end of 2019, uh, Philip always has been and will be a gentleman, but... There was something different with Philip before he was saved. He had no joy. As he described to you this evening, he was, he was of men most miserable. And God has brought a big change in salvation. And salvation brings a change, dear soul. It changes your destiny, changes your outlook, changes your enjoyment, changes your, the th things of which you have interest in. And it's been a great joy to see the change that salvation has wrought in the life of Philip and to see him going on and is a great encouragement to us there in Bucknar. And so we trust that some dear soul might be saved this evening, just as you've heard from Philip how his soul was saved. John's Gospel, chapter 3, well-known portion of Scripture. And we'll read from verse 14. This is the familiar discourse of the Lord Jesus with a man called Nicodemus. And he's seeking to explain to him his need, and yet something of the provision that has been made to meet his need. And he says to him this in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the verse upon my mind. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten. Son of God. And verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And we'll turn to chapter 5 and verse 24 for one more verse. John 5 and 24. I'm encouraged that some of these verses have been quoted already and in the prayer meeting. John 5 and 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. We know that God will bless to us these portions 
from his word. Whilst we're in chapter 5 and 24 there, see the great change at the end of, of the verse. But is passed from death unto life. Just as we've introduced this section of John chapter 3 and already, we have noted the, the great context of this verse 17. It's sad really that this verse um, falls under the great shadow of that lovely verse of John 3 and 16. For John 3, 17 is a great gospel text in its own right. And yet they saw verse 16 truly is a great verse and has been the source of blessing to many. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I tell you, I'm glad today I stand here and I have a message for the world. I have a message for each and every one in the room this evening. Each and every soul in Ballyclare, if they'd only be pleased to come in uh, and be under the sound of the, the voice of God. I, I tell you, God is interested in the world. That's one of John's great themes as he writes. Here's a message, and it's not for sex and for groups and for different persuasions and for different genders. It's for the whosoever. It's for the world. And yet... The Lord Jesus, he had a great interest in individuals as well. He had a great interest in individuals. And here is a, a chapter and an account of a one-on-one -on -one discourse, the Lord Jesus with a man, seeking to help the man identify his need, enlighten his darkened mind, show him the way, and point to himself as the only means of salvation. I tell you, it would be a good thing this evening, would it not, if some individual in the meeting would recognize that they have a need and that there has been one that has made the way possible, has provided and done all, required that you might be saved. That's the position that Philip came to, to realize that underneath the umbrella of that great word all, there is me. And there's a choice to be made this evening, dear soul. There's a matter to be settled. And these things are important. These things are vital to address. And the, the Lord Jesus, with great tenderness and with skill, went through the Scriptures and sought to get to the root of the man's problem. And so that forms something of the, of the great context of this verse. You know that there's a story there that's alluded to. The Lord Jesus, he took, a ma took this man to the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures of which with which he was very familiar. And he told him of this story again, that maybe if you've been to one or two meetings here, you might have heard. Just in summary, the people of Israel, there in Numbers 21, they, in short, they had sinned against God. They had sinned against God. I tell you, it's a solemn thing to sin against God. It's a solemn thing to have sinned against God. And the Bible tells us that each and every one of us are guilty of just that. Rebellion against the holy God of heaven. And here was a nation, here was a people, and they had sinned against God. And God will not leave sin unpunished. And these fiery serpents came in to the camp as they moved, and punishment and judgment came in. And through the sting and through the bite of the serpent, death ensued such that many of the people died. Great judgment had come upon them for their sin. And yet the, the leader of those people, Moses, was his name. And he goes to God and he, he seeks to intercede on their behalf, to plead for some mercy. And God provides a way. God provides a way. I tell you, dear soul, Lest we don't get there, we trust we will. God has provided a way. God has given his answer to the great problem of sin. The great problem that's come in and affected every man. Man and woman, boy and girl in this meeting. The whole world guilty. The whole world under sin. And none excluded. And here was a problem that infiltrated the entire camp. And death would have ensued upon all. 
but for the provision of God. And God provided a way. There was one way. Just one way. The, the means of escape had some similitude to the problem. A brazen serpent. I tell you, there's one who came and he took upon himself flesh and blood. There was a real man who was God himself here on this earth. That he might go and be made a sacrifice and offering for sin. Entirely sin apart, that blessed one that God provided. And he went to the cross and was made answerable for sin. And God provided a means here for the people in Numbers and 21. And there it was set amidst the people, high, lifted up. All could see it. And it was told them this, that everyone, none was excluded from this. The provision was sufficient for all. Everyone who would just but look upon the serpent would live. It was a look of faith, a look to realize that there, that is sufficient to meet my need. That is the answer to my problem. And to recognize that if God says that is the way, that's the way. I tell you, that's simply what faith is. Today we stand and tell you that Christ has died upon the cross. He has born and gone beneath the holy righteousness of God. God has poured it out in full upon his Son. There's nothing left to do. He cried, it's finished. God's judgment exhausted in full. And the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, having cried at his finish, voluntarily, in complete control, bowed his head, gave up the ghost, his spirit, given back to his Father. And he was laid in a grave and triumphantly rose again. And I tell you, God is saying today, there is the provision that is the answer to your problem, dear soul. And simply to come just like Philip did. Those four or so years ago, three, three or so years ago, and recognize that God has provided a means. God has provided an answer to my deep problem. It's in his Son. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so, dear soul, that's the great context to these verses. The Lord Jesus, I believe, is speaking in verses 14 and 15. He directs this man's attention to that serpent that was lifted up. He's now speaking upon about himself. Even as Moses lifted up in the, the serpent in the wilderness as a means, as a way of escape, even so must the Son of Man. Speaking of himself, be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then John, as he writes his gospel, I believe, he now goes on to expand this and gives us that lovely verse, John 3 and 16 and 17. For God so loved the world. In this manner, just as a provision was made there in Numbers, how far, how much more wonderful is this provision that God has made? And that God so loved not just a group of people passing through the desert, but he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not a brazen serpent upon a pole, but his own beloved son, that whosoever believeth in him, that's simply the look of faith, look and thou shalt live, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, just as those serpents inflicted that fatal wound, but not only would they not perish, they would have everlasting life. I tell you, there's something far more wonderful than the life that was given there in Numbers 21. They were free from that disease. They lived a few more years and again they died. We're here to tell you today of, we're speaking on the spiritual sphere, of course, that not will you, not will you perish in hell and in the lake of fire forever, but it's possible to have eternal, everlasting life 
to enjoy it now and then for all eternity. Never to perish, never to be lost. And so the context for this verse. I say there's a great contrast in this verse. There's a great contrast in this verse. There's a lovely contrast in in verse 16, is there not? Perish, everlasting life. I wonder, dear soul, what you'd write over your head this evening. Would you have to simply and solemnly cry, I'm perishing, I'm perishing. I say there might be some in the hall tonight, and you're perishing. You're condemned already. The wrath of God abides over your head, waiting to fall, perishing. Or are you like the most of us that believe in this hall this evening and we have the great joy within of everlasting life? Hath everlasting life. I love the way that Philip emphasized that. It's a great promise. We read that, did we not, in chapter 5 and verse 24. Verily, verily. It's one of John's great 25, verily, verily. It's truly, truly. He that believeth. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. These things are sure and certain, dear soul. Do you know it for yourself? To have the great possession that is eternal life. There's a great contrast in verse 16. There's a great con- contrast in 17. Condemnation and salvation. Condemnation and salvation. You see, the great point of this text is that whilst inherent within every single one of us, there is a great problem. And the the great question of your your sin, dear, dear soul, will not go unpunished. And if not put right in this life, you will be punished and judged for your sin and for your rebellion and rejection of God's way of salvation in eternity. There will be condemnation. That's a solemn thing. But when God sent forth his son into this world, the first time that he came, he didn't come to pronounce the judgment and the condemnation then and to banish every soul to hell. I tell you, he came with a word of life. He came with a word of hope. He came that he might go to the cross and make it possible that even 2,000 years later, we're preaching the way of life. The way of hope. The way of lasting joy. And it is possible, dear soul, just as he made provision for the world, that you will not need to come into condemnation eternally, but that you can know that great word, saved. Saved. That's a precious Bible word, is it not? Saved. Only a sinner saved by grace. I wonder, are there any in this meeting? And I'm just looking in your eyes even now. And you're not saved. You're not saved. You don't know the joy of God's salvation. That's a solemn thing. The context of the verse, the contrast within the verse Just very, very briefly, the content of the verse. I tell you, there's a word that caught my eye in this verse. It's the word world. Three times. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I notice the middle use of that word, world. There's an implication. There's an implication. And that is the world and its sin. We've touched on this already. There is sin rife in this world and it resides within each and every one of you. Just look within and see a heart that is black with sin. There is implied in this verse that there's something worthy of condemnation and dear soul, it is your sin. There's an implication in this verse. I tell you, there's grand intervention in this verse. I see the word, the first use of the word world. For God sent not his son into the world 
I say I'm glad that God intervened again in this world. It was the world that his hands had created. We're speaking, of course, here of the world of men. But God made the world and the heavens and the earth. He placed man in it. It was very good. And man sinned and rebelled. There was a great problem entered in. And yet God, in his love, as explained in verse 16, he gave his son. And God intervened. It wasn't reactionary. God ever had in mind that he would send his son. And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. But it wasn't to condemn. It wasn't to bring the world into final condemnation. It was to provide a means of salvation. And I look at that last word, the word world again, and I'm thinking not now of an implication or of intervention. I'm thinking of an impartation. God would have you, dear soul, to be saved. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I tell you, that takes you in, does it not? It took me in. It took Philip in. It's taken many a dear soul in this room in that the world through him might be saved. I tell you, don't think about the person in the seat next to you. Don't think about the neighborhood, those that you'd like to see coming in and saved, great as that is. Think upon yourself, dear soul. Are you saved? Or is it written over your head, condemned already? I tell you, verse 18 is a great text. It's very clear, is it not? He that believeth on the Son. You know, he that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Verse 36. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. God would have imparted to you today salvation. Would you come just as a lost, guilty sinner? Recognize that you have a great need, but leave today with what God would have you have, and that is his salvation, which he has made possible in his Son. Simply come as a repentant sinner and take God at his word. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Apologize for going over a few minutes. Shall we pray? Father, we thank thee for these gospel texts of which we've been able to read. We thank thee for the clarity of thy word. We trust that even as these texts have been read in the hearing of the people, that they might speak to them very clearly. And trust that uh, any comment spoken upon it might be used to the convicting of a soul and their salvation. We thank thee for what thou hast done in thy Son. Thy desire for all men to be saved, thou hast made it possible. We pray that some dear soul might recognize their need and might apply it to themselves today and go in for thy so great salvation. Part us now with thy blessing and in thy fear. If there are any troubled and anxious souls about salvation tonight, may they ensure that tonight they need leave it no longer and have the matter settled and that for all eternity. We thank thee for the joy that salvation brings, the possession of everlasting life. May it be the portion of all this evening. As we part, pray for the gospel as it will go forth later on in other parts. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.